So the technical problem solved. Uh, hello, dear students. Today I will tell about something more biological than chemical, so nanotoxicity on cell low level. Uh, well, we'll be talking maybe a bit of repeating because we already talked a lot about different types of cytotoxicity, but from perspective from synthesis or functionalization. Uh, today we will talk uh, more about the mechanisms of toxicity when you uh, introduce some nanoparticle inside the cells. So the next lecture will be about organ-specific toxicity. So uh, when you have some cells with some, uh, when, when they're affected by some, for, for example, reactive oxygen species or something like this one, what will happen to organ? Uh, where the cells exist. Uh, so uh, before we start, uh, I just need to check if uh, everything is goes okay. It's just six people, as I see. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I need to tell you about just a reminder if something forgot. Uh, today we will have our Zoom session. So uh, today will be three people. Uh, only but uh, 15 minutes 15 minutes uh, after the end of the lecture we will be moving to zoom according to this uh, link and we will be listening to three presentation uh, so next Tuesday will be probably three people too uh, if someone forgot uh, that they should present their topics on Tuesday uh, you can check a Google table uh, in common folder with your reports and dates and so on. Uh, and today we need to choose another four people for next Friday uh, presentation. So if, uh, again, if uh, someone wants to volunteer, you are free to place some messages in chat if you want to present on Friday 11. Uh, and uh, in the middle, again, in the middle of today's uh, lecture will be a test to assess your knowledge of previous lecture or about functionalization, so be prepared, maybe like in 40 minutes. Uh, so, okay, one volunteer here. Uh, well, now we need to proceed. Uh, if no questions, then we go. So, uh, before we even start with uh, about talking uh, about some mechanism of cell toxicity, we need to uh, talk a bit about how the nanoparticles uh, uh, went inside the cells, so what are the pathways. And, uh, well, some cells can eat nanoparticles, basically, but uh, not just eat, they can even drink nanoparticles. Uh, and there's a lot of methods for uh, uh, for cells to uptake these nanoparticles. And uh, basically, uh, if you look to, for example, a uh, biological course for, uh, from uh, maybe not school, but university, uh, there's not much talk about what are the real ways for something to enter the cell. Uh, because basically it's just the active transport or passive transport, uh, but passive transport is uh, for uh, not for nanoparticles, obviously, because passive is just passive, uh, passive uh, going through uh, membrane, and uh, obviously nanoparticles can enter the cell only through active transport. Now, maybe in some cases when, the, uh, when nanoparticles can penetrate uh, and damage the membrane, they can well, like passive transport, but it's uh, not a uptake by the cell. It's a damage uh, which is done by nanoparticle. Uh, so, uh, if we're talking about active transport, there's a lot of uh, types. And, uh, well, for now, it's uh, basically four types of uh, cell uptake, uh, nanoparticles uptake by cell. Uh, uh, they can be... Uh, receptor mediated or receptor independent. So uh, on the cell membranes, it's uh, there's a lot of receptors, of course, uh, and this receptor can distinguish some nanoparticles and uh, uptake them. So uh, in some cases, these nanoparticles can be beneficial, or uh, elemental composition of these nanoparticles can be beneficial for the cell. For example, they need some metals, maybe iron. Uh, but uh, in most cases, no, but still. Uh, and there's two main, uh, 
two main pathways to uh, for nanoparticles to enter the cell. It's uh, two receptors, covalent receptor and classane receptor. So it can be uh, covalent mediated, classane mediated, or both. Uh, uh, or both independent. So uh, it can be just, uh, let's say, phagocytosis. Uh, and in case of, well, phagocytosis, it's uptake of something hard. Uh, so it's some particle, not a liquid. Uh, it, and it also can be some liquid, uh, for example, uptake of liquid uh, drops or just liquid. And in case of liquids, it's called not phagocytosis, but pinocytosis. Uh, and uh, it was believed uh, until some recent moments that uh, all of heart nanoparticles can be uptaked only by phagocytosis until the moment uh, that macropinocytosis was discovered. Uh, so for now, uh, if we're looking for uh, more precisely on different uptake methods, uh, phagocytosis. Uh, well, if you're talking about nanoparticles, uh, most of the people will uh, definitely say that nanoparticles can be uptake only by phagocytosis. But now, to understand what phagocytosis is, you need to understand that uh, phagocytosis is for really large particles. So, uh, for example, macrophage or white blood cell can uptake another cell. So it can, uh, another cell, it's like 20, 30 microns. So uh, phagocytosis is for really big objects, maybe for uh, not in nanoparticles, for microparticles. Uh, so yeah, of course, some, uh, some nanoparticles still be, can be uh, phagocyted, but uh, not all. And if we're talking about some nanoparticles with a size uh, about one micron or less or a bit bigger, now we may talk about micropinocytosis. So it's drinking of, let's say, some not very small particles. Now still it's like a drinking, not eating, uh, but it's micropinocytosis. And if you're talking about different clathrin or covalin uh, mediated endocytosis, uh, so uh, see the difference, phagocytosis, endocytosis, so phag uh, phagocytosis and, and uh, endocytosis, it's uh, uh, very similar terms. Uh, but in case of receptor-mediated uh, pathways, uh, you see that the size of the nanoparticles, uh, like maybe 60 nanometers, uh, 120 nanometers, uh, 90 nanometers. So, uh, well, in general, they, uh, they really exist some dis um, a difference between uh, different receptor-mediated uh, pathways, uh, entry pathways. Uh, but it's not a rule, so it's not just all of the nanoparticles with a size like 60 nanometers will definitely enter so clearly in mediated endocytosis. Nope. But uh, in some cases, uh, you can assume that uh, yes, if particles have something like this uh, dental with uh, this dimension, uh, they can enter with uh, this receptor mediated, mediated method. But uh, uh, you should understand that, uh, again, protein corona, different uh, proteases, uh, uh, enzymes in your blood can do something with the size of your particles, especially if they're covered by PEC, for example. Uh, they have some uh, size which can change in time. Uh, so they are like where soft particles can be and what the exact size, maybe 60, uh, 60 maybe 120. So uh, it's a very complex, uh, complex uh, issue about how the nanoparticle can enter uh, the cell. But well, mostly all of the nanoparticles, in some ways, can enter most of the cells. So just to understand. But uh, if you go on further about what happened to nanoparticle inside the cell, so if cell eat this nanoparticle. Uh, that's for some reason, obviously. And uh, what's this reason? Uh, because cells want to obtain some you know, nutrients, let's say, so some something to build proteins, maybe, to build some lipids, uh, as well as we eat. Why we are eating? Because to get some nutrients. Uh, so uh, first, uh, uh, the first stop of nanoparticle inside a cell is uh, early endosome. So 
Well, in some cases it can be called just endosome, but if we go in so precise terms, it's early endosome. And if this nanoparticle, microparticle, doesn't matter, is some of polymer, for example, maybe it's a lipid, maybe it's a protein, maybe it's some uh, bio, uh, biodegradable uh, polymer, uh, it can be uh, transferred uh, almost directly to Golgi apparatus. So Golgi apparatus is like a storage of the cell. So every, every uh, useful molecule can be stored in Golgi. And if it cannot be uh, directly transferred to Golgi, it should came to a late endosome. So uh, late endosome can be a very big uh, organelles and on this step it again can be, well, First one, it uh, undergoes slow, uh, slow degradation, slow recycling. So uh, if uh, something which uh, enters uh, early endosome is not needed for a cell, it can uh, undergo fast recycling and go out of the cell. So in out, very fast process can, uh, uh, it's require maybe even some uh, minute, minutes for, to go through this road. And uh, on the end, we will have some exosomes. So endosomes inside, exosomes outside, and I talk about exosomes on the last lecture. Uh, so, uh, and in case uh, if uh, fast recycling uh, is not av uh, available, and uh, this is really some useful molecule, particle, or something like this, and it needs uh, further proceeding inside the cell, it can transfer to late endosome. And if it's very hard to do something with nanoparticle even in late endosome, it can go uh, through slow recycling pathway. So again, exosome sent out of the cell. But uh, in some cases, if something which enters the cell is need to be destructed, destroyed, degraded, it can uh, well merge with lysosome. So lysosome, it's like a stomach of the cell. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of enzymes uh, in this lysosome and well if something happened just uh, just for you to know because we will uh, not talk specifically about this uh, if something happened with lysosome for example if lysosome will be uh, destroyed uh, all of the enzymes will leak uh, out inside the cytoplasm so uh, and this is not very healthy uh, you should understand this. So uh, if uh, nanoparticle can damage, uh, uh, well, here it's called late endosome and endolysosome, but mostly uh, in most of the researches, uh, merge between uh, endosome and lysosome called late endosome. So in this diagram, it's called endolysosome. Uh, so uh, in any way, when uh, late endosome meets with lysosome, it form uh, like an enzyme uh, organoid with uh, organelle, uh, with some enzymes inside, some nanoparticles inside, if you're talking about nanoparticles, and this enzyme tries to uh, dissolve these particles. And uh, this is an important step because on even, uh, especially in this stage, uh, occurs a lot of reactive oxygen species, different ions, and so on. Now, because when uh, enzymes try to degradate nanoparticles, uh, uh, some of the ions can be released from the surface of nanoparticles, uh, and these ions will affect, uh, well, uh, will affect uh, maybe lysosome and or lysosome structure. Uh, because uh, because the membrane of this organelle is the same membrane as of the cell. Now, so it's just the lipids. And if some ions can cause lipid peroxidation, uh, we will be talking about this now, uh, the endolysosome will degradate and everything will pull out inside the cytoplasm. Uh, and uh, this is like we have some, uh, again, if uh, some analogies with a human, uh, if you have some uh, penetration of our, for example, stomach or something like this, we will uh, have some sepsis and so on. Uh, and, well, it's one of the main roads of physical damage uh, to the cell if lysosome or endolysosome will uh, may be damaged. Uh, well, uh, let's proceed more precisely to what really ha can happen to the cell, and obviously we will start with reactive oxygen species. So about maybe 90% of the damage 
or even more, uh, which can nanoparticle uh, down to the cell is associated with gen uh, generation of reactive oxygen species. So almost all damage. Uh, and when we're talking about uh, ROS types, uh, maybe uh, not all of you are familiar with what is reactive oxygen species. So it's um, ions, uh, which molecules, which have unpaired electrons. So in case, for example, of oxygen we all breathe in so our cells also breathe in and they need oxygen for different reactions uh, and in case uh, there are some uncoupled electrons in oxygen it can be transformed to super uh, superoxide anion uh, it may be not very dangerous but uh, the more dangerous version of this is peroxide ions so peroxide ions as you can see have minus two uh, uh, two unpaired electrons at, and this is very dangerous uh, dangerous species uh, hydrogen peroxide not very healthy obviously because we're using this for sterilization in our laboratory but uh, there's a lot well maybe not a lot but it's definitely some hydrogen peroxide naturally occurs inside the cell uh, and this is uh, not the most dangerous molecule that can be found inside the cell because it also can be hydroxyl radical which is uh, much more toxic uh, and also you don't uh, uh, need not to mess it with hydroxyl ion because hydroxyl ion uh, is non-toxic compared to a hydroxyl radical so with some examples of uh, here here and here it's some uh, examples of oxygen species but now, uh, of course, it can be some other types of which can uh, contain other elements than hydrogen, uh, hydrogen or uh, uh, oxygen. So uh, it can be chlorides, it can be iron, uh, different iron uh, ions, and other elements can be involved in producing uh, of excess oxygen species. But uh, if we're talking about the natural occurring reactive oxygen species, we need to talk about what are the source of this of, of ROS inside the cell because uh, every cell, for example, uh, uh, every cell have some you know, mitochondria, so it's a respiratory chain, electron transport, and during this electron transport, it's obviously that some of uh, ROS uh, generated by cell uh, cell itself. And if we have some ROS inside our cells, there uh, definitely should be some mechanism to eliminate this reactive oxygen species. So in, uh, uh, naturally, it's uh, not a big problem uh, for the cell if some uh, reactive species occur in, inside the cytoplasm or inside around maybe cytoplasm, inside some organelles. Uh, because it's a lot of different oxidases, catalases, uh, and other molecules which can eliminate this uh, oxygen species. And uh, for example, we have even we have some uh, organelles uh, like peroxisome. Uh, if you look precisely, it's very small uh, organelles uh, which were discovered maybe 50 years ago. And despite this peroxisome is uh, not in the list of the main organelles inside the cell because when we are first, uh, for example, in school, we learning about uh, cell structure it's like a nucleus, membrane, mitochondria, maybe uh, central enzyme, lysosomes. Yeah, it's Golgi apparatus. But peroxisome, uh, maybe some of you never heard about peroxisomes, but there's even diseases, human diseases, which are associated with dysfunction of peroxisomes. And uh, what so special about this organelle? Well, this organelle contains almost all catalase inside a cell. Uh, and catalase is one of the most important uh, enzymes which, uh, well, catalase. Now, <laughs> we will be talking details in a couple of slides. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't talk today much about biochemistry because as you can see, biochemistry of this process, it's very complex. Uh, and it's not, uh, not um, my duty to explain during the course of nanotechnology how all of this happens because uh, it's uh, neither important for you, neither interesting, I think. So we will be talk just about how this happens uh, without very deep details. Uh, 
Uh, so again, that's a lot. Uh, it's a lot of different pathways for the cell to produce and to eliminate reactive oxygen species. But if something happened from outside, so it's some uh, additional uh, molecules came inside the cell, which can produce some uh, additional reactive oxygen species. Well, cell have some capabilities, so there's some. Uh, ability for the cell to produce extra uh, extra elimination molecules, uh, but every capabilities is limited. So if we exceed these capabilities, so there will be a lot of nanoparticles, a lot of uh, oxygen species. The cell will definitely die, uh, and the main uh, main road of uh, so the main pathway for excess oxygen species to damage the cell is. Definitely, it's oxidation. Uh, so, uh, oxidation of everything. Uh, these uh, free radicals can uh, oxidize almost uh, every molecule in the cell. And, well, there's three main types of molecules. It's uh, lipids, it's uh, proteins, uh, and, uh, and it's someone calling me. Uh, it's uh, lipids, proteins, and DNA. Now, if it Talking about lipids, well, uh, lipids is a, it's uh, forming cell membrane. Uh, so uh, cell membranes and membranes of all other organelles. Uh, and if something happened to lipids, uh, it's called lipid peroxidation. Uh, and li uh, some some products of this lipid peroxidation is also toxic, but the main damage, of course, uh, connected with uh, damage to ion channels, uh, different metabolism processes, and so on. Uh, if damage happened to protein, we are all forms of protein life, so if something happened to protein, it, it can ca cause some aminoic acidation, and definitely it will lead to the act uh, deactivation of enzymes, or in some cases activation. Uh, and uh, main, uh, most of the uh, signal molecules are also enzymes, so some signal pathways will be destroyed or inter uh, interrupted and so on, and inability to maintain ion gradients and so on. Uh, because uh, our well, uh, pores uh, inside the cell membrane, cell membrane not only lipids, it's uh, lipids uh, plus proteins, so ion channels, uh, are mainly protein structures inside our cell membrane. Uh, so we maintain our uh, disrupted, uh, lipids disrupted, membrane disrupted, cell, cell dying. So cell dying, tissue injured. Uh, and if we're talking about DNA, well, DNA, it's a very, uh, <laughs> very complex structure which uh, uh, not always damage to DNA can be discovered very fast. I mean, uh, if something happened to DNA, we need to wait uh, until cell division or maybe some time for cell to understand the DNA damaged, uh, protein production uh, can be preceded and so on. So uh, DNA damage mainly associated with uh, oxidation of DNA bases, which will lead to uh, two most uh, important things associated with, again, nanoparticles toxicity, it's mutation. Uh, well, and DNA damage, and DNA damage is mutation in any way. So this mutation can lead not to, not to cell death because uh, with some mutations, cells still can survive and uh, transform to malignant cells, to a tumor cell. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, it, it will be maybe even more dangerous than just a cell death. So cell death is just inflammation. And cancer, it, well, it's also inflammation in some way, but um, uh, it, in, in most of the cases, cancer are uh, much more difficult to treat than just inflammation. And, uh, well, anyway, uh, this scheme looks very, um, very, not very complex, but if we look on more precise scheme, uh, you'll definitely see it's a lot of molecules. And again, this scheme is uh, also not very complex uh, in, when compared to uh, larger schemes. But I just want to show you that there are also some you know, very dangerous molecules, for example, uh, not molecules, reactive oxygen species. For example, uh, I like this, uh, like this one because it's very easy to remember or know. 
so when something happened uh, to your cell uh, which contain or no well it's definitely go to apoptosis or necrosis now uh, and as you can see uh, this uh, blue colored uh, blue colored molecules uh, they are needed to fight excess oxygen species for example salt superoxide dismutase uh, and uh, glutas uh, glutasyreductase and well gase h is one of the most important molecules now uh, cells which are needed to uh, fight excess oxygen species so uh, it's uh, as you can see for example superoxide dismutase uh, is needed to uh, transform uh, two superoxide ions into hydrogen peroxide so so it's called superoxide dismutase uh, and in case of for example uh, glutathione uh, it can uh, further decompose hydrogen peroxide into just uh, water and oxygen so uh, as you can see all of these molecules are just in cycles uh, and uh, in case uh, hydrogen peroxide cannot be transformed into water for example if there is no much gas H cells uh, some of the hydrogen peroxide can be involved in phantom reaction and phantom reaction will be discussed maybe on the next slide uh, so if something uh, happen uh, something happened even to one uh, component of this scheme uh, something happened to a whole cell so uh, even a single molecule matters and uh, well again now what are the main uh, components of rexif oxygen species species uh, elimination pathway so again it's superoxide dismutase which transform to uh, uh, superoxide uh, ions to a water uh, water plus oxygen uh, it's a catalase uh, which uh, located in peroxisomes and which uh, uh, well transform uh, for example uh, hydrogen peroxide into water plus oxygen and there's also glutathione peroxide days which uh, can also helps to transform hydrogen peroxide to water molecules uh, and well uh, if there's some there's some very complex schemes again uh, so if something uh, bad happens uh, during these pathways uh, on doesn't matter on which stage uh, it will definitely lead to a very complex cascade of reactions and these cascades will lead to a cell death or uh, well uh, cell cycle arrest cell cycle arrest is something that happens when the cell exposed to some uh, additional reactive oxygen species uh, uh, level so if the cell detects that something ha bad happened to the cell and the cell need to eliminate additional threat like uh, for example additional oxygen species uh, some of the uh, proteins for example fox1 so it fox head box protein uh, this protein uh, encoded by the same gene so gene foxa uh, this uh, protein is triggered gene is triggered and this gene uh, can cause a cell arrest so cell will not divide because if something happened to dna this uh, mitosis can lead to mutations and so on uh, so uh, in cell cycle arrest uh, for example foxo pathway or uh, e2f uh, pathway so e2f it's uh, again group of genes that it cause some transcription uh, a transcription also very important if you have some damage to dna uh, so uh, it's a very complex scheme but again if uh, there's uh, two main pathways and the foxo maybe no one of you even heard about it but it's very important protein if something bad happens to this protein it's called uh, it can cause uh, some uh, for example as you can see here uh, retinoblastoma it's one of the uh, most important uh, most uh, dangerous uh, tumor cells or inside our eyes for example uh, so these pathways are mm, a cascade of different reactions which are intended to arrest the cell in a specific uh, cycle step just to give it enough time to eliminate this excess oxygen species so uh, 
a very complex cascade in initiated if this and if this cascade is not succeeded in elimination this race so uh, a lot of damage done to dna a lot of damage done to lipids uh, to proteins and so on this will definitely trigger uh, apoptosis or necrosis well maybe not necrosis apoptosis of the cell no so uh, it also can trigger not a cell death uh, if uh, the damage wo uh, was repaired. Uh, some of other uh, proteins will trigger a cell cycle progression, so the cell will start to divide, to grow, or something like this. But it can also cause some autophagies, so the cell will uh, eat in some of the, its part, so cell will eat itself. Uh, partially and uh, eat some damaged mitochondria, maybe some damaged uh, proteins and lipids and again after this one it can uh, progress to a cell, uh, cell cycle next step in cell cycle uh, but uh, uh, let's proceed maybe to uh, some examples of what can, uh, ha can happen to the cell uh, in case of lipids peroxidation uh, the main uh, cause uh, the main uh, uh, damage done by lipids peroxidation is damage to well lipids to membranes uh, and uh, on the way to lipids peroxidation the uh, glutathione peroxidase 4 which is the main part of elimination of the damage done by peroxidation of lipids so glutathione peroxidase is formed by, uh, based on just the glutathione uh, and uh, this uh, molecule can be, so it's a phospholipid hydroperoxidase. It can uh, repair some damage done to lipids uh, just to form again a normal uh, lipid bilayer. Uh, and if this, uh, for example, ultrasound doesn't succeed because of a low level inside the cell, uh, this damage can proceed further, for example, to ferroptosis, and this will cause some diseases, injuries, and definitely cell death. Uh, and if we even don't look on this one, some of the lipid peroxidation products can be also dangerous because they are toxic to the cell. Uh, and we already talked a lot about uh, ferroptosis. So ferroptosis, it's, uh, as you can see, ferro, so something connected with iron, and ptosis, uh, uh, ptosis connected with apoptosis, so connected with the death. Uh, so it's definitely a death uh, associated with introduction of iron uh, ions inside the cell. Uh, as you can see, mitochondria is uh, is an organ which produces all of the energy. So it's an energy plant of our cells, and uh, mitochondria usually precede one oxygen atom uh, atom oxygen molecule uh, to superoxide uh, or water. And in case of superoxide, there is a lot of superoxide dismutases inside the cell, uh, which can uh, form uh, from superoxide hydrogen peroxide. And this uh, hydrogen peroxide, following a catalase, uh, catalase treatment, uh, can be uh, further transformed to water and oxygen, and oxygen again goes to mitochondria. So it's just a cycle, a cycle, cycle, cycle. But in case something happened to sod. Uh, and if we have some uh, ferrocyanes inside our cells, uh, hydrogen peroxide can be transformed to uh, hydroxyl, and this hydroxyl can cause a cell death, well, some damage at least. Uh, and uh, the process uh, involved in ferroptosis is called Fenton reactions, so it's some of these reactions. Uh, not just one action. If you have some ferrous uh, two plus, uh, two plus uh, plus ions uh, and some uh, excess of hydrogen peroxide, it can form some hydroxyls. Uh, same, uh, we see a uh, uh, result of this action is ferro, uh, ferrospheric ions, and these ferric ions also can uh, can um, react with hydrogen peroxide and form. <laughs> again some ferrous ions and some hydroperoxyl so uh, this is like again a cycle uh, and if we have a lot of different ferro ferrous ions inside the cells well it definitely some damage through so ferroptosis pathway uh, uh, and this is mostly in case we have some iron particles maybe not iron oxide because it's very hard to get some ferrous or ferric ions out of Ferrous oxide. Uh, ferrous oxide are very stable, 
uh, even under some uh, very acid conditions, but still uh, most of the iron containing particles uh, have some toxicity, cytotoxicity during a Fenton reaction pathway. Uh, and uh, if you look further on uh, other examples uh, about what can cause uh, reactive oxygen species accumulation and damage, uh, we need to talk about uh, nanozymes. Uh, well, uh, nanozymes, it's something that can possess um, properties or functions of uh, natural enzymes. So something inorganic, which possess properties of organic. And uh, there's a lot of different particles that can be used as nanozymes. For example, even gold nanoparticles and magnetite particles can, uh, uh, can uh, mimic oxidase activity or peroxidase activity. Uh, but there's also serum particles, uh, which can possess, uh, uh, depending on the uh, surface functional groups, uh, for example, serum oxide particles can possess both catalase activity and superoxide dismutase activity. So uh, this is very beneficial property to be said, because if you have some additional reactive oxygen species, uh, these serum oxide particles can be used and as a, well uh, antioxidant. And if but but. Uh, if we look on uh, different cell media, cell culture media, <coughs> not just uh, physiological conditions, uh, in presence of, for example, phosphate anions, some particles can possess a very different properties. Uh, so it's just, it's not just take that, take some random uh, serum oxide nanoparticles, introduce them inside a cell, and they will act as superoxide dismutase. Uh, uh, for example, here, uh, researchers in this paper have some serum oxide particles, uh, nanoparticles, and uh, these uh, serum oxide nanoparticles were, uh, were with different oxidation states, so 3 plus or 4 plus, and uh, in presence of phosphate anions, these particles behave completely different. So in case of 3 plus, they uh, possess some superoxide dismutase. Uh, mimetic activity, but in case of Fa plus particles, uh, oxidation states they have no catalase activity. So it's uh, again, as I talked uh, previously, it's very important to properly characterize your particles. So at least you should understand as a researcher what the type of uh, oxidation state in your particles. So what is the real composition of your particle? Uh, and uh, if you look even further, it's also some uh, other examples with uh, other particles, for example, our nanoparticles, uh, so gold nanoparticles, in case uh, there's some uh, hydrogen peroxide, for example, uh, and we add some gold nanoparticles uh, without ATP, so, uh, e uh, well, ATP naturally present in all of our cells because it's just the main energy molecule. So if we don't have some ATP in our solution, uh, this nanoparticle will have some low peroxidase activity. But in case of high ATP concentration, uh, gold nanoparticle will have a high peroxidase activity. And uh, we always need to understand what, uh, what will be the real condition for our nanoparticles inside the cells. Uh, so how they will behave uh, in uh, conditions where there is no ATP or there is a lot of ATP uh, because the uh, uh, outcomes of these particles can be completely different. Uh, but again, uh, you should uh, always pay attention to, uh, attention to what you are reading because both of these papers, as you can see, they uh, wrote by the same person, the same year, not a very good journal, but uh, still you need to know that there definitely some uh, alteration of uh, non enzymes activity exists, but, well, just pay attention. Uh, and. Uh, Maybe it's an obvious question uh, for you. Uh, if we have so many problems with reactive oxygen species uh, connected with nanoparticles, why just not to add some antioxidant molecules just to reduce this uh, generation of this species? We just can cover our particles in something, for example, uh, so glutathione, for example, and uh, uh, it's indeed some uh, gold nanoparticles exist with glutathione coverage, glutathione shell on the surface. Uh, 
it's uh, needed not just to uh, reduce a ROS level, but uh, for a better uptake, better stability and so on, but doesn't matter. Uh, what is matter is that uh, cell need reactive oxygen species for a proper proliferation. Uh, and uh, if we just look on this scheme, uh, scheme uh, as you can see, ROS is needed for, uh, well, in some cases, tumor cell proliferation, but uh, normal cell proliferation too. Uh, and in case we eliminate all, for example, of hydrogen peroxide from a cell, uh, the cells will uh, proliferate uh, much more, uh, at much more slower rate. So uh, it's a... Um, some of the staining used to uh, uh, to assess uh, level of uh, proliferation. So we'll we'll talk about this method uh, on our six or seven lecture. For example, it doesn't matter. But uh, what matters is that uh, when you uh, increase uh, increase hydrogen peroxide uh, concentration, for example, uh, the level of uh, as you can see, it have some uh, maximum on this, uh, on this uh, plot, and in some uh, uh, concentration, it's beneficial for cell proliferation if some of hydrogen peroxide exists. Uh, obviously, at very high concentration, proliferation uh, decreased, but uh, also if we look here, uh, you know, for example, some concentration of hydrogen peroxide is needed for cell to proliferate uh, at much at more much higher rate than uh, in absence of hydrogen peroxide. Well, it can be also connected with uh, known phenomena that uh, some toxicants at very very small concentration can uh, uh, can uh, let's say increase proliferation of the cell. No, because uh, if you have some toxicants inside your cell, they can uh, activate cell, like cell cell stress, and uh, under this stress, cells can proliferate much faster. But it's like uh, it's like a human when a human have some stress, something happen, it can lift away uh, heavy things, and ca a human can run faster. Uh, jump higher and so on. So the cells uh, have some some mechanisms. They can produce a lot of uh, valuable molecules to maintain their uh, their life. But after this stress, uh, they can obviously die or something can bad, bad ha can happen. So uh, DNA damage is again associated with. Uh, oxygen species because as I said almost 90% connected with generation of ROS in cell and uh, there's a lot of ways to damage DNA because it's a lot of components of DNA obviously it can be some uh, damage to nucleotide bases it can be damage to for example strands uh, some base mismatches some miss of even one base or so on and uh, if you look here it's uh, some of this damage are most likely to be caused by oxygen species some are most uh, most likely caused by uh, some radiation uh, and so on <coughs> uh, and for example if you have some particles which can produce uh, UV photons uh, this also can cause some damage to DNA uh, and uh, what's so special about damage to DNA? Uh, it, a lot of damages, type of damages of DNA, for example, single mismatch or loss of nucleotide, can be easily repaired because uh, it's a very complex repair system in uh, in in the cell. It, it's DNA uh, polymerase, uh, which can well, it's not a, it's not my duty here to describe how the damage can be repaired, but still. Uh, some damage can be repaired. In case there's a very huge, a, a very, uh, very serious damage to DNA structure, which cannot be repaired, the cell will go to apoptosis, basically. Uh, but uh, if we look into, uh, but uh, this da uh, damage needs some time to be repaired or to be assessed. So it's not just uh, one second to uh, understand for the cell that the damage is too big to, repair, to be repaired. And uh, this time can be uh, 
really long because uh, well it's just can be hours maybe or something like this uh, before before to uh, division cycle before to my toys and uh, uh, if we look uh, well this is a paper about uh, toxicity of metal nanoparticles so metal nanoparticles can produce a lot of uh, different ions uh, which can cause uh, damage to a cell uh, to produce the uh, rex of oxygen species and uh, this particular particles is nano uh, as stated here so it's nano uh, TO2 so titanium dioxide which is basically not a metal it's a metal oxide uh, and cobalt particles uh, um, titanium dioxide may, may be the most uh, widespread uh, type of nanoparticles uh, in our world because it's used in a lot in a lot of cosmetics and so on uh, and uh, in a lot of productions and uh, cobalt particles may be not so uh, widespread but still uh, and uh, what uh, shown here on these histograms it's a cell viability so cell viability assessed by maybe MTT assay or XTT or other type of metabolic assays uh, uh, which assessing just a cell viability in terms of uh, working mitochondria so they basically assessing just uh, some uh, proper work of uh, oxidoreductases and uh, well basically mitochondria viability and uh, <clears throat> of course, some damage can be done even to uh, mitochondria DNA because you know it's some DNA inside mitochondria. Uh, but this DNA not not the main, not the most important part uh, when we are talking about these assays. Now, and uh, these assays may be uh, associated with uh, very serious damage to mitochondria. So when mitochondria is completely destroyed and so on. Uh, again, if you're looking on these histograms, as you can see control samples like uh, zero, uh, zero mi micrograms per milliliter, uh, it's 100% of cell viability. And if you're looking on this concentration, uh, they're not very high uh, because uh, it's like 20 maybe or 40 uh, micrograms per milliliter. And, uh, and uh, uh, the case in cell viability is something like 20. 30 maybe uh, and uh, the difference between these two assays i believe uh, in different methods to, for assessment uh, this is maybe like mtt assays this is maybe some some other kind of assays uh, it doesn't matter it's still metabolic assays uh, and uh, in case of this assay we will see that uh, maybe old age uh, uh, and in case of the second uh, we'll see that uh, well cobalt is uh, definitely more toxic than, than titanium dioxide it's not uh, it's not a surprise because uh, oxides are less toxic than pure metals and uh, as you can see the difference between these two assays are also very uh, very high between because this we have like 20 percent here we have like 40 percent so twice uh, and again we will talk about this uh, in details uh, when we will uh, discuss in the different uh, ways to assess uh, in vitro viability of the cells uh, but what is most important uh, that even 40% uh, decrease in cell viability is not very high. So it's still 60% uh, of cell mitochondria, let's say, or 60% of cells uh, are in good state, a relatively good state. Uh, and uh, what's so special about this? Uh, we're talking about DNA damage. And, and if we use some sp uh, very special staining for DNA damage, uh, for example here, we will see that uh, uh, DNA, uh, damage associated with DNA will, uh, when we're using a zero concentration, so no toxicants, it's like uh, again 100% uh, control sample. But when we are uh, talking about titanium dioxide, there's uh, obviously no damage. Why? Obviously, because again, it's oxide. It's uh, not very toxic in terms of uh, generation of reactive oxygen species, but uh, cobalt particles, uh, they are toxic. And as you can see, even concentration of 15 micrograms per milliliter uh, uh, give like uh, two and a half. So it's uh, more than a twice increase in uh, fluorescence intensity but what uh, uh, what is uh, especially important if we look on this assays both of these assays uh, 15 uh, micrograms give nothing here 
well maybe maybe like 95 percent but not statistically uh, significant difference and if we look here also the same result so if you perform some assays connected with just metabolic activity there will be uh, there is no possibility for you to detect the damage done to DNA so uh, what I want to say uh, uh, DNA damage is delayed damage uh, it's not just uh, DNA damage cell dying no no uh, the DNA damage and cell may die in a day maybe maybe not longer but still in some, not uh, immediately and even more important cell may not die it can undergo some mutations survive and form uh, a tumor uh, well if there's just one cell maybe a couple of cell maybe even 10 or 100 of cells uh, our immune system can eliminate these cells macrophages uh, can uptake these cells destroy the cells and so on but in some cases if we have some special already have some special mutations in our organism in some cases uh, nanoparticles can really trigger some uh, tum uh, uh, tumor process formation process and uh, if you look further for uh, two other type of uh, DNA damage uh, assessing uh, for example this one uh, is the main product one of the most simple to detect a product of DNA damage and again uh, you can use some staining uh, to assess uh, how much of these products are inside the cell so the more of this product the more the damage done to DNA and uh, if you look here again uh, titanium dioxide uh, give nothing so it's uh, uh, 12 hours and 20, uh, 24 hours so titanium dioxide again non-toxic but in case of uh, cobalt particles again we will uh, we have something like for example here it's a natural state so some of these products are natural occurs inside the cell uh, but in case of cobalt particles we will have again twice the uh, twice increase so twice here more than a twice twice here uh, and uh, it's have some uh, propagation so after uh, additional uh, t uh, 12 hours we have some maybe 20 percent more uh, and again there is nothing here nothing here and here is obvious sign of DNA uh, how it's called genotoxicity uh, and well but uh, not all of, uh, all of the damage are, uh, let's say, damage, because in some ways, it's just one slide for you uh, to understand, in some ways damage uh, can, be, uh, can have some positive uh, outcome, because you can use, for example, some gold nanoparticles, uh, you can eliminate these particles, and some photons which were produced by these particles can cause oxidation of uh, photons or electrons can cause oxidation of DNA and damage to DNA and this can be used to eliminate some bacteria for example no, or maybe viruses or something like this one so damage is uh, sometimes is needed uh, for proper work of your nanoformulations uh, and well now we will uh, go to another type uh, which is physical damage uh, because uh, as you must understand nanoparticles steal some uh, physically hard so it's some mechanical mechanical uh, chunks particles which can physically damage a cell so it's uh, it still can occur even on this small scale and uh, this impact of uh, particle shape or not even shape but sharpness uh, uh, this impact was discovered maybe not so long ago maybe like 15 years ago uh, because it was uh, found that uh, now, for example, gold particles. Uh, the uh, historically was one type of gold particles, so, which is spherical nanoparticles, uh, and uh, later it was discovered that it's possible to synthesize some not spherical particles, like uh, elongated rods or star-like particles with different spikes. Uh, and in case of uh, gold nanoparticles, uh, cell mainly do not need gold inside the cell. So if uh, some gold nanoparticles enter the cell, it goes to endosome, endosome go to lysosome, so late endosome, and the lysosome, uh, call it as you want. And uh, gold cannot be degraded by uh, intercellular enzymes, and it's almost 
uh, unchanged uh, goes out uh, in exosome and in culture media so it's just a gold a gold cycle inside the cell but if the sharpness uh, uh, changes so the shape changes and this uh, uh, shape will be with some sharp edges uh, this particle can damage membrane because cell membrane is only a couple of nanometers so it's two five nanometers the cell membrane is very very thin structure uh, and in case of nanoparticles nanoparticles uh, nanoparticle spikes can be like 20 nanometers so it's like 10 times bigger than uh, as in cell, uh, sickness of cell membrane it's the same uh, same uh, analog with a knife and human skin so a knife much much bigger than a sickness of human skin it can easily penetrate it so so the nanoparticle they can easily penetrate this bilipid membrane and uh, release in uh, cytoplasm and remain in cytoplasm and more important accumulate in cytoplasm because uh, well in normal healthy state uh, a cell doesn't have a specific mechanism to find something bad well there definitely exists some mechanism for eliminate some uh, some uh, let's say mitochondria some damaged ribosomes and so on but uh, in case of nanoparticles accumulation cell doesn't have any mechanism to eliminate these particles because what, what can be a mechanism again exocytosis uh, but uh, if nanoparticle uh, if cell will form some exosome around this uh, around this particle uh, this particle again will damage this exosome and still remain inside the cell so for these very sharp particles it's almost uh, impossible to uh, exit the cell and they will accumulate and they will damage because they can damage uh, some uh, organelles uh, inside this, uh, the cell for example mitochondria again physical physically damaged uh, and so the toxicity mainly associated with very sharp particles uh, how it looks on for example transmission electron microscopy because um, you can uh, el um, uh, element, uh, assess your cell, cell uh, toxicity using electron microscope uh, if you look on spherical particles uh, again gold particles uh, they are mainly found in lysosomes so it's a lysosome as you can see here uh, it looks uh, brighter than the uh, other type uh, other structures in the cell because it's like a bubble uh, bubble filled with almost nothing just the proteins so it's uh, electron uh, electronically not very dense at, um, dense but uh, particles are very dense so they found in lysosome uh, but in case of various uh, this uh, called uh, gold nanostars so because they looks like a bit like stars uh, also can be called nano sea oceans and so on because of the spikes uh, and if in, ca in case of these very sharp particles, uh, you can see their spikes may be like 50 nanometers. So, uh, so they are no, very, very uh, sharp and very, very big compared to a cell membrane. If you look on cell membrane, for example, here, uh, you will see that the thickness of this membrane cannot be even distinguished uh, because it's like a, a grid or out. Uh, some void space and uh, this is a cytoplasm and you don't even see a difference uh, in gray and gray scale because uh, the cell membrane is very very thin it can be even distinguished but uh, where you can find this <coughs> very sharp particles inside the cytoplasm uh, you don't see any structure science uh, uh, any structure around these particles so like here you see a lysosome there is no lysosome no, so it's just a cytoplasm accumulation and well in some cases uh, this uh, shape dependent uh, shape dependent toxicity can be associated not just with damage and accumulation of particles inside the cell but also inside the cytoplasm but also uh, damage to an uh, outer membrane uh, if you look in, for example on these particles uh, it's a uh, no, toxicity to antimicrobial uh, antimicrobial effects to toxicity to bacteria uh, and uh, different antibacterial uh, nanoparticles are widely used now for example it's zinc oxide particles and so on uh, and uh, uh, this research has found a very interesting phenomenon because if we have some 
uh, if you have some uh, spherical particles, there doesn't matter what uh, the uh, concentration of these particles. So uh, low concentration, medium concentration, high uh, concentration, which is uh, which results in, in aggregation of particles. As you remember, maybe on second lecture, I talked to you that aggregation state is very important when we're talking about toxicity. Uh, so, in case of spherical particles, there is no toxicity uh, and uh, this doesn't matter what the concentration and aggregational, sta uh, aggregational state conditions. But uh, if we uh, go to some particles with uh, very narrow spikes, uh, for example, this one, if you look on it, uh, it's like 10 nanometers here scale bar. bar but uh, it's not very uh, thin, as you can see, it may be 50 nanometers, but still it's relatively sharp uh, compared to a cell membrane, which can be like microns in length. So uh, if you look here at low concentration, uh, concentra uh, interaction is very weak, but at some medium concentration, interaction will become strong. And if we further increase concentration of particles, uh, it can cause aggregation. So uh, if you synthesize some particles, never try to reach some very high concentration of your particles because uh, it will definitely lead to some aggregation due to increase of ionic strength, uh, strength and uh, interparticle, uh, interparticle uh, connections and so on. And uh, in case of this one, if we have some aggregation of the particles, uh, it is very hard for them to damage uh, to damage cell membrane because they are uh, interfering with each other and uh, some of the particles forming a layer on the surface uh, prevents other particles to penetrate this membrane. And uh, what, is, what is interesting here is that uh, the most uh, damage to cells was found in some medium concentration, not at a high concentration. Well, this is very interesting finding, but uh it can be considered in some ways uh and also uh what is so important about these particles well these particles uh i believe silver nanoparticles yes uh and if if you look on spherical particles they're not very spherical after all uh, there's a lot of byproducts a lot of uh anisotropic particles but uh yeah also this uh, this spiky particles are not very uh, monodisperse at all because it's like spikes, it's like uh, some, I don't know, ellipsoids, some pyramids and so on. But uh, in any way, if you look on uh, toxicity profiles uh, of these particles, uh, you will see uh, this one for spherical uh, and, uh, well, no, 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 this one for uh, rod, uh, rod shape like, uh, like uh, sharp particles uh, and this one for spherical particles. Uh, the profiles are very uh, very the same uh, as you can see and numbers are uh, almost the same but look at the concentration so if you look on concentrations sp uh, spherical particles toxic only at very very high concentration and uh, sharp particles are toxic at much more lower concentration maybe twice maybe thrice lower than uh, compared to spherical so uh, despite not very significant difference in shapes, so it's a lot of different shapes in these spherical particles. Uh, and uh, in, if you are looking here, it's also a lot of other shapes than, uh, than sharp. And sharp, not very sharp after all, but on the cell level, the, uh, even this difference in shapes are uh, very significant, like three times more significant. Uh, and if we're looking about, uh, talking about <clears throat> different types of shape dependent toxicity it also can be even such type as channel blocking so it's a lot of channels inside the cell membrane and these channels uh, well they're not very big uh, they are compared in the size with nanoparticles uh, and this is a very uh, interesting paper maybe a single of its kind which shows that some particles can block ion channels uh, physically block these ion channels. Uh, for example, this one is short for single walled carbon nanotubes. No, so it's a, a schematic presentation of uh, nanotubes and nanospheres. Uh, and if you look on um, ion channel, it's not very, so it's just uh, one protein. It's not very big in length, not very big in size. And in case of 
uh, very specific uh, diameter of uh, carbon nanotubes, these carbon nanotubes can block, physically block the channel. So if you have a very big nanotube, it will just uh, stand on the top of this channel and some of the, for example, ions or molecules can pass through this channel. But in case uh, the size of nanotube meets, uh, precisely meets the diameter of this channel, it will block it and prevent some ion uh, income or outcome uh, of, uh, in, inside the cell or outside the cell. Uh, so these nanotubes can be used as ion channel blockers and uh, well can be used for some uh, antimicrobial, for example, treatment, I don't know, something like this one to trigger some kind of toxicity. But again, as well as with DNA damage, uh, some damage to cell membrane can be beneficial. Uh, for example, this one example, uh, uh, if you want to ins uh, deliver something inside the cell, you definitely can, uh, can use some very sharp nanoparticles uh, to penetrate the cell membrane. Uh, and if this damage will be not very high, not, uh, not very extant, the cell membrane will heal itself because cell membrane is uh, uh, very, uh, very fluent, let's say, structure. It it's looks like a gel. Uh, so in case of very small, uh, in case of very small damage, it can repair itself, but uh, when the hole in, in the membrane occurs, some of the uh, some of the molecules from a culture media can enter the cell membrane, and for example, in this case, they can be used to uh, increase substrate transport and uh, increase uh, some uh, biocatalysis in yeasts. Uh, and uh, if you look on some images, it looks uh, just for you to understand what is the interaction between the cells and nanoparticles. Uh, for example, if you look here, the interaction is very tight, so it should be like uh, nanoparticles smash the cell so to penetrate its membrane. But uh, still at least they have a, a bit uh, another structure of a cell membrane, but still. Uh, but if you're looking at, uh, talking about uh, some uh, animal cells, uh, it's also can be uh, useful for you to penetrate the cell membrane, for example, for transfection. Uh, and uh, what can be uh, done to a cell, for example, here you can see uh, the concentration, uh, it's fluorescent images of the cells uh, incubated on the surface covered in gold nanostars. So uh, we have here the same concentration of fluorescent dye, so the staining is the same, but as you can see fluorescence intensity is different because uh, here is a control sample and this is a sample and also this is a sample. Uh, which were grown on the substrate on the surface covered with these spiky spheres. And these spikes, uh, under some uh, light radiation, laser radiation, uh, caused damage to the cell membranes, and some additional fluorescent dye uh, came inside the cell, uh, so resulting in a brighter fluorescence. And uh, if you have not a fluorescent dye, but for example, some RNA or DNA, uh, you can use this technique to transfect your cells, so to uh, uh, perform some damage to your membrane, but the damage that can be repaired. And But obviously, if you have a lot of, uh, here is again fluorescent is for living cell, uh, but here uh, you also can see some signs of red fluorescence. And red fluorescence are for dead cells. So if you have a lot of uh, nanoparticles, for example, here it's a concentration of nanoparticles per one square centimeters. So if you have a lot of nanoparticles, so you have a lot of membrane damage, uh, this membrane damage can be repaired by a cell and more cell will die. So you definitely need some proper concentration of your nanoparticles if you want to uh, damage your cell membrane in a controlled matter, uh, manner. So, well, it's some uh, positive outcome, some positive usage of nanoparticles and physical damage or of the cell by nanoparticles. Uh, and uh, we need to move further on in the very first test, an introduction test, I asked you if there are any uh, type, uh, what are the main type of damage uh, which can done, uh, which can perform nanoparticles to a cell and almost no one uh, uh, answered that there is damage to a cytoskeleton. Maybe because some of you don't know what a cytoskeleton is, but cytoskeleton is very important. Uh, 
uh, here it, it's a very famous picture and I think it's a most beautiful picture when we're talking about fluorescent staining because uh, staining of cytoskeleton is uh, usually very beautiful and as you can see here it's different types of cytoskeleton so uh, it consists of uh, basically three uh, kind of uh, structures it's uh, microfilaments it's a uh, microtubules and some other intermediate filaments and as you can see here they can be all of them can be stained uh, white uh, uh, and nucleus uh, stained with blue uh, white, uh, why all of these cytoskeleton uh, molecules uh, parts are important because they are responsible for cell shape they are responsible for cell transport and they are responsible for phagocytosis uh, and uptake of different uh, uh, different molecules and uh, particles from media. So cytoskeleton uh, is a very important structure inside the cell and any damage to cytoskeleton can lead to a cell death uh, at least to some disruption in cell uh, metabolism. And this is especially important for muscle cells, obviously, because muscle cells need to perform some physical work uh, using the cytoskeleton. And uh, if we're looking you now, what can happen to a cell upon uh, some nanoparticle uptake? Uh, this again is a staining for cytoskeleton. And as you can see, it's pure cytoskeleton of a healthy cell. Uh, the cytoskeleton spread along, uh, along the cell and there's not much voids inside this cytoskeleton. But if we have some nanoparticles, uh, in this case, it's magnetic nanoparticles, which are believed to be non-toxic. Uh, but uh, here it was found that uh, in places with a lot of nanoparticles, if you have some merging between fluorescence of nanoparticle and fluorescence of uh, cytoskeleton, we will see that in some places there are obviously some voids, especially here. You see there is a lot of spherically looking voids. And this spherically looking voids uh, is aggregation of nanoparticles. Uh, you can see this aggregation is here. So in places where nanoparticles exist, uh, there is no cytoskeleton or at least the cytoskeleton is damaged. Now, why this damage occurs? Uh, it's another question because cytoskeleton again formed from proteins. And uh, again, proteins can be oxidized. They can be damaged, physically damaged uh, by these nanoparticles. Uh, and uh, again, uh, this can cause some inter uh, interruption or with cell metabolism. Uh, and uh, if you look uh, even further, uh, you can see that uh, it's not a damage to cytoskeleton after all, but still, uh, it's important calcium, uh, calcium concentration is very important for cell metabolism, uh, also for some cell cytoskeleton work. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, that uh, uh, this is from the same paper. Uh, uh, it was uh, very interesting to understand what uh, what is the real cause for damage of cytoskeleton. And one of the suggestions was that uh, that uh, magnetic nanoparticles can reduce the calcium levels inside the cells. And indeed, it was true. Uh, some of magnetic nanoparticles can uh, reduce by some means reduce calcium concentration inside the cytoplasm. Uh, which is probably can uh, cause a damage to uh, cytoskeleton. But this damage, uh, despite it, it's some damage, obviously it's some damage, is this damage is not very uh, significant. So the cell may survive because uh, a lot of other cytoskeleton molecules exist uh, and, well, it can be repaired. Uh, and uh, this another type, another example of cytoskeleton damage uh, now to some uh, heart cells, so my, uh, myocytes. And these myocytes, uh, again, you can see some control samples, it's uh, act actin filaments, and uh, uh, there's no uh, silicon nanoparticles. So this work is about uh, silicon nanoparticles. Uh, so silica, silicium dioxide, uh, widely used in different spheres in biology. Uh, but still it's not approved for different medical applications. So alumina approved, uh, magnetite approved, but not silica despite its very long history. And uh, as you can see here, it's uh, well, can be toxic. Uh, any particles can be toxic, but silicon nanoparticles can be toxic, for example, for our heart uh, tissue, for 
now for my sites uh, and again uh, it can done some uh, damage to cytoskeleton as you can see here uh, it's some silicon nanoparticles and in place uh, where where the silicon nanoparticles occurs uh, there's some damage to a cytoskeleton but uh, what the mechanism is not very clear uh, still uh, this is not only the uh, not only the one problem with silicon nanoparticles because from the same paper uh, it's also a trigger in uh, autophagy. Uh, what is autophagy? It's um, a process uh, which starts when the cell needs to uh, eliminate some damaged part of the cells, for example damaged mitochondria or other type of damaged organelles. So it's uh, the dissolution, destruction of uh, some cell parts. And uh, well, it's a normal process. It occurs in every cell, but in case something happened to the cell, for example, some damage uh, induced by nanoparticles, this uh, autophagy can be very, uh, very uh, widespread in the cell and cell can be even uh, destroy itself uh, during this process uh, of uh, autophagy and uh, in case of silicon nanoparticles it's the same particles as from the previous slide so the same as here uh, you can see that these silicon nanoparticles uh, can be uh, can be accumulated in some inside some of the structures of a human heart uh, and this accumulation in some cells can lead to a very big autophagosome. So autophagosome is uh, again some organelle, temporary, uh, temporary organelle, which uh, consists of different uh, products of cell uh, metabolism and cell, uh, cell destruction. So a lot of nanoparticles uh, found here and a lot of autophagosome found in these cells. Uh, so uh, what was the conclusion of this paper that uh, you see these autophagosomes are very very big uh, compared to a whole cell structure. Uh, so uh, the conclusion uh, and for example this is mitochondria if you are able to uh, able to see there's inner structure of mitochondria so it's mitochondria Christ which is used to produce ATP. Uh, and of course it's a lysosome, a lot of lysosome uh, in, in the cytoplasm. So what was the conclusion? The conclusion was that uh, silicon nanoparticles can, uh, can trigger a, a very serious uh, uh, autophagy in our Huvex cells which uh, can be located on uh, all of the, uh, in uh, all of our vessels and this is uh, can be a very a uh, serious outcome of using silicon nanoparticles. So autophagy trigger is can be also considered as one of the nanoparticles, uh, nanoparticle signs of toxicity. Uh, no, well, so we need to proceed further and I believe this is the last part, but again, not least because it's a mitochondria damage. Uh, if we uh, talking about mitochondria damage, uh, well, again, mitochondria it's an uh, energy plant of our cell, and damage to mitochondria is uh, almost uh, again 90% associated with generation of excess oxygen species. Uh, but in some cases, it also can be a physical damage. So again, mitochondria have some membrane which is very similar to membrane of the cell, and very sharp particles can damage this mitochondria, but also some surfactants, for example, as we discussed on the first, maybe or second lecture, some surfactants can damage mitochondria because mitochondria is mostly membrane. So it's an organelle which formed from membranes, a lot of membranes inside, outside and so on. Uh, so every particle which possess some membrane damage uh, behavior will definitely damage some mitochondria. Uh, and uh, well, mitochondria damage, uh, it's, not very, uh, it's not very difficult to damage mitochondria because this organelle is very sensitive to different reactive oxygen species, to different molecules, uh, and uh, it's uh, on, uh, on the mitochondria membrane some, pot uh, some potential which should be of uh, particular uh, value and if the, uh, this potential decrease or increase the mitochondria will undergo some maybe even destruction and so on uh, 
No, and uh, what happened to a cell at all when some mitochondria damaged? Well, it's a cytochrome C inside of mitochondria, which used uh, uh, in uh, uh, electron chain, but also cytochrome C is a trigger of apoptosis. So it's a du dual moiety of this molecule. And if some mitochondria damaged, uh, physically damaged, or well, doesn't matter, so destroy it, let's say, uh, cytochrome C uh, leaks to a cytoplasm, and in cytoplasm it triggers a caspase 3 cascade, uh, it will trigger apoptosis. So if you damage mitochondria, it's not always connected with just uh, reducing of ATP level, for example. It's not always connected with uh, re uh, reduce, uh, reduction in some produ uh, produce, uh, producing of molecules. It can be just connected with release of cytochrome C. So it's physical damage, cytochrome C, apoptosis. Uh, and uh, obviously there's some particles which can possess some uh, mitochondria damage. Uh, again, it's uh, titanium nanoparticles, uh, titanium dioxide, and some titanium dioxide with ferron contents, iron content. And uh, what is so special about this uh, research, because uh, the main damage to mitochondria was associated with difference in shapes. Uh, but uh, along with shape difference, it's also a content difference, between, uh, because, for example, elongated uh, particles, nanorods, uh, they have ferrum content, and ferrum content, as we heard today, can cause a Fenton reaction, so ferroptosis. Uh, and if you have some titanium dioxide content when, well, titanium dioxide can produce some reactive oxygen species upon radiation with uh, ultraviolet, and uh, this can induce some swelling of mitochondria. But inside, uh, but uh, if you're talking about uh, some elongated particles or ferrum containing particles, it can be a reduced swelling of mitochondria. Uh, and uh, in case of reduced swelling, in case of this particle, there is no co uh, no damage to chain complex two, but respiratory complex. Uh, and uh, the work of respiratory complex uh, is a main uh, um, uh, main uh, let's say main thing which is assessed by different mitochondria assays. So MTT assay, which is uh, used for almost all researchers of nanotoxicity mainly works with this respiratory chain complex. So it's assessing respiratory chain activity, how mitochondria can uh, produce ATP and so on. Uh, uh, so in case of this damage, probably MTTSA will definitely show that there's some damage to a respiratory chain. Uh, and uh, what is uh, important here is that uh, in this particular research, titanium dioxide particles really show some damage to mitochondria despite the spherical shape and despite this is titanium dioxide. So it's not a uh, metal particles, it's metal oxide particles. So in uh, every, uh, when you working with some particles, you always need to perform some uh, additional uh, uh, investigation of your cells, uh, cell viability because even if your nanoparticle looks biocompatible like here it's ferrous dioxide and so on it still can can uh, cause some cytotoxicity and in case uh, your part nanoparticles looks uh, like a ferrum content, content yeah it can produce some ferric or ferrous ions and uh, the shape not very no, suitable for some uh, intercellular delivery, it can physically damage some membranes. But uh, what is surprisingly in this case, there was no damage to respiratory chain complex. Uh, it's not including that uh, these particles can uh, cause some other type of damages. For example, it's uh, they can damage some uh, just membrane, just a cell membrane. It can damage some other organelles. But uh, we, when we are talking about mitochondria. It is dangerous, it's not dangerous. Uh, and again, the last slide, uh, uh, if we previously talked about how it can be beneficial, well, uh, damage to mitochondria also can be beneficial if we are talking about some tumor tre treatment, some, uh, bacter uh, some bacterial treatment, uh, not treatment, but elimination. Uh, and, uh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, 
so what can be a positive usage of mitochondria damage uh, well definitely it's some damage to a mitochondria of uh, the cell which we want to kill uh, and if some cell up uh, uh, and uh, it's also beneficial for these nanoparticles if they want to damage mitochondria they need they must to uh, escape endosomes so they should have uh, some very sharp edges or they should have some functional groups uh, which allows them to exit uh, to escape endosomes and uh, further target some mitochondria and damage this mitochondria and the elimination of mitochondria called mitophagy uh, mitophagy and uh, well if a lot of mitochondria damage the cell will definitely die now, one of the process, uh, processes involved in damage of mitochondria and elimination of mitochondria is called parking mediated uh, mitophagy, and this is one of the ways to uh, eliminate some damaged mitochondria, for example, in neurons. Uh, so, if something happened to mitochondria, for example, increased uh, reactive oxygen uh, species level or decreased the potential uh, membrane potential of mitochondria. Uh, some of the bio biochemistry processes are curious and this will lead to formation of autophagosome which will incorporate uh, damaged mitochondria with uh, lysosome enzymes and well mitochondria will be uh, destructed and if a lot of mitochondria is destructed the cell will die and the, well uh, it will be beneficial if we are intended to kill this cell so obviously it's a lot of other kind of damage which can be done to a cell uh, and uh, reactive oxygen species can damage almost all of the membranes almost all of the organelles we didn't talk here about nucleus for example or ribosomes or Golgi apparatus or some other structures uh, because if we uh, now went uh, back to the start of our lecture as you can see there's a lot of organelles inside the cells and almost all of them can be damaged by nanoparticles uh, well, uh, it's a very, very complex uh, topic to discuss, but I hope I give you at least some basic knowledge to understand. And on the next lecture, we will be talk uh, about what will happen to organ or to a tissue uh, when some of this cell damaged. Uh, well, so uh, when just one cell damage or a couple of cells, 100 of cell damage is not very problematic uh, for a cell be, uh, for an organ be, because it's uh, millions of the cells inside this organ uh, but in case uh, when thousands of cell damaged well it definitely will cause some consequences some inflammation so on and we will discuss on the next, le next lecture so if you have questions now i am happy to answer and do not forget that in 15 minutes i'm waiting for you in zoom session and three of you should present the topics today do not forget about this so now just waiting for you to ask me something so in zoom session here link here uh, you can find this schedule in your uh, common folder on Google Drive. So I believe in any way you have a common chat uh, for my uh, course. So I hope everyone will find this link. So if no questions, well, you can ask me questions in Zoom session. So I'm waiting there and like now it's uh, 20 minutes. So we will start probably at 30, something like this one. So take your tea, take your breath and so on. At 30 or maybe 35 minutes, we will start our session. Waiting you there and the lecture, lecture for today is over. Thank you for attending.